Hey guys, so this lecture is going to cover the um, evolutionary origin of eukaryotes, um, some of the structures and things that are found on the inside of eukaryotes, how they move around, how they use those structures, um, and then it's going to finish up with a little brief um, overview of some of the medically significant eukaryotes that are found um, that you guys might encounter in a medical setting. So first thing first, um, the very first eukaryotic fossils appear on the earth around 2.7 billion years ago. Um, they're very simplistic fossils. Um, I have a picture of those in this PowerPoint in just a second. Um, but evidence uh, suggests that um, primitive eukaryotes arose through a process of symbiosis um, through uh, something called the endosymbiotic theory. And this is essentially how this works over here. Well, you guys see here a very large prokaryote that has some kind of a uh, little simple cell structures inside of him, not anything very fancy. And a little folding of the membrane here kind of functions like an endoplasmic reticulum. You can see the ribosomes and stuff there as well. And over here you have a small prokaryotic cell um, that lives by itself, um, but these guys can live inside of cells, things like rickettsia. Um, rickettsia bacteria is an intracellular parasite, so it makes sense that they live inside of other cells. Now, here's how the process of eukaryotes um, is thought to have evolved. So what happens is cells eat other cells all the time. So you have this large prokaryote, he eats a smaller prokaryote, he brings him inside of his cell. And when that happens, um, for whatever reason, this uh, cell that's been eaten, this little small rickettsia cell, um, does not become digested. Um, it doesn't break, uh, um, break down inside of this cell cytoplasm, it's not broken down and digested. So this little small cell persists. Um, the DNA inside of this little bu uh, bubble here from the membrane eventually becomes the nucleus. You can see what happens there. Um, and these little tiny, small um, bacteria that were eaten start giving energy to the big cell. They don't have to go out and find food anymore, so they have a lot of excess food. They don't have to work anymore to, to do anything to find energy. This big cell goes and finds all the energy for them, gives them uh, gives the little cells protection. So both of these guys get something. The big cell gets lots of energy, and the little cells get protection from the big cells, uh, anything that's going to eat them out there. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So these little small cells start to independently um, divide with inside of the cell, a couple more uh, membranes twist and fold and things like that. And eventually what happens is you end up with a very primitive form of a eukaryotic cell. It's got a small bacteria-like things inside of it that make energy, primitive mitochondria thing. Um, and eventually what happens is those things become uh, permanent. Um, they have their own independent DNA inside of them. Um, they divide separately than our cells. They have a different type of ribosome. Um, so they're very interesting. They're very, uh, a lot of evidence to support that these guys actually are evolved from uh, primitive bacteria. Um, so cytoplasm, um, or excuse me, uh, it's chloroplast in photosynthetic bacteria and algae and things like that, plants, um, is thought to have evolved the same way. So one of these uh, similarly uh, um, ancestral eukaryotes that already had a primitive form of a mitochondria inside of it um, absorbed a photosynthetic bacteria. I'm usually called a cyanobacteria. Um, and then this relationship just persisted. Um, whereas this plant cell over here, high plants, uh, higher plants, algae, uh, things like that, um, retain those chloroplasts inside of them so it can get energy from mitochondria as well as chloroplast. Um, whereas animal cells did not uptake this secondary endosymbiosis to bring in a chloroplast. So the organelles that are now inside of a eukaryotic cells were originally trapped inside of them um, as uh, tiny little simplistic prokaryotes um, at one point in time. So this is the endosymbionic theory. So these are our ancient eukaryotes here. You can see the small little chloroplast dots um, all throughout the cells, the cell wall over here um, of this particular ancient eukaryotic cell. So here's uh, the two classifications, um, or the couple of classifications, I have to say, of eukaryotes that we'll talk about. They're usually broken down based on the cellularity. If you're unicellular, multicellular, or both. So protozoans tend to be unicellular. You might have some that can stick together and form a little colony. Fungi and algae um, can be unicellular, can be colonial. Um, colonial organisms mean that uh, they live in a group, but they're unicellular. They just live together. They don't need each other for uh, to be able to survive. Uh, multicellular. Um, multicellular organisms mean you need all the other cells to survive. So uh, colonial and multicellular may seem similar, but they're not. 
Um, more than one cell living together, but the cells don't need each other. More than one cell living together, and the cells all need each other kind of thing. So fungi and algae can fall into any of those categories. And then helmets and arthropods, or helmets or worms, um, arthropods are like a tick things like that. Um, they're all going to be multicellular. Um, so we'll talk about these guys that are found in the medical world that play a role in disease spreading around and diseases themselves. Um, so we'll talk about these guys in just a second. So let's work our way from the outside in of our eukaryotic cell, um, starting with the uh, boundaries of the cell. Cell wall, cell cytoplasm, and all that good stuff um, from the outside. So same as we did with our prokaryotes, we're going to start with things that are on the outside. So in eukaryotes, you will find a flagella. The flagella that's found in eukaryotes functions the same way as the prokaryotic flagella, as in it spins around and allows the organism to move. They are put together completely different. Now, if you recall, the prokaryotic flagella was just one filament. These guys have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 filaments put together in groups of two, nine little groups of two, and plus two in the middle. So nine plus two arrangement is how these flagellas are put together. So it's 20 filaments compared to the bacterial filament of one. So totally different. Um, it functions the same. It's quite a bit thicker, but it allows the organism to move. Um, one of the other big differences here is the bacterial flagella is just on the surface of the cell. Um, so the bacterial flagella just sits on the surface of the cell. Um, whereas the eukaryotic flagella actually is um, covered with a cell membrane um, from the cell itself. So you can see here, this is the cell membrane from the cell. This is the flagella poking up here. The flagella is on the inside. You can see that here. And you'll see the cell membrane come around all the way up covering the flagella and then going back down, continuing around the cell. So the same thing happens here. The flagella goes all the way around this, uh, with the cell membrane, all the way around the flagella, and then back around the cell. So whereas our prokaryotic flagella is exposed to the environment, making it a very easy target for the immune system, these guys have a hidden flagella covered up with that um, cell membrane. So the function of the flagellas in the prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the same, but uh, motility, but the way that they're put together and the way that they look and structures and things like that are totally different. One of the other ways that um, eukaryotes will move around um, is using an uh, apparatus called a cilia. It's essentially a tiny little flagella that moves in a stroking pattern. They move in one direction, just back and forth. One move this way and then strike back. So they move back and forth. They just flick back and forth like this. When it pulls this way, it can pull food into this organism's mouth. You guys can see the little oral groove over here. Um, the cilia will beat this direction pulling food into the little organism's mouth. Um, they can go the other direction and push this little guy around in the environment. They can push down, um, giving him a little bit of thrust, and he can move uh, around in the environment like that. So cilia are very interesting. Tiny little t similar to flagella, not exactly the same. They work pretty much the same. They're found all over the organism, and they are only found in eukaryotes. No prokaryotic cells have cilia. They are only found in eukaryotes. Um, the outer covering of eukaryotes is also known as a glycocalyx. Um, it's the outermost boundary that will come in contact with the environment. And in most of the time, it's going to be made out of sugar um, of these guys. You can have a slime layer, once again, that loosely packed, loosely organized layer of sugar, or a very thick capsule. Um, these are going to be mostly found on a um, few protist species, lots of uh, um, um, things like that. Yeast cells sometimes have a glycocalyx. Um, and underneath the glycocalyx, you will find some um, eukaryotic cells that have cell walls. Not all eukaryotic cells do. Almost all fungal species do. Their cell walls are made out of um, chitin, a specialized form of sugar. Um, most algal and plant cells have one as well, made out of cellulose. Um, a couple of protozoans will occasionally um, have cell walls, very few of them. Um, most uh, algae don't have cell walls. Excuse me, I think all protozoans lack cell walls, and all animal cells lack cell walls. We just have a cell membrane that surrounds our cells, whereas fungus, most algae cells, and um, uh, bacteria, not eukaryotic, but bacteria, all have a cell wall. We, as animal cells, 
um, and all protozoans lack that. We just have a membrane that surrounds our cells. So the cell wall, um, it does the same thing it does in prokaryotes as it does in eukaryotes. It's hard. Um, it provides structure and support, that rigid um, support layer that uh, allows the cells to uh, uh, stiffen with water and fill up with water um, and not pop. Um, if you're a plant, that allows you to stand upright, that filling up of water um, and things like that as well. So if you're a fungi, you're going to have chitin um, that makes up your cell walls. Um, occasionally, cellulose it can be mixed in there depending on the different type of species, uh, different types of sugars and things like that. But chitin is the main thing that makes up the cell walls in fungi. And algae is going to usually have cellulose and some pectins and things like that, silicon dioxide, calcium carbonate, um, things like baking soda, glass. Um, so it really just depends on the species in question here. So underneath the cell, um, right on the inside of the cell, underneath the cell or sorry, the cell membrane, right underneath the cell wall, um, the cell membrane is the exact same thing in eukaryotes as it is in prokaryotes. That double layer of phospholipids, the heads and tail regions. Um, you're going to have proteins and things embedded in it for support. You're going to have sterols um, that allow the uh, cell wall to have or cell membrane, excuse me, to have some fluid fluidity. It can allows it to flow around, but also be stable at the same time and not fall apart. Um, they are selectively permeable, um, which allows the concept of osmosis and diffusion to occur. Um, it allows some things in and some things um, are not allowed to be in. That's the selectively permeable part. Some things can easily flow through. Some things have to be brought in using energy, using proteins and specialized uh, um, things by the cells. So selectively, some things can come in very easily. Some things can't. So it's selectively permeable. And once again, um, the um, eukaryotic cells contain membrane-bound organelles that make up 80% of the volume on the inside. Um, so the vast majority of the eukaryotic cell is going to be made up of all the um, mitochondria, the ribosomes, all the good stuff, the nucleus and stuff inside of them. Speaking of the nucleus, what is it? Well, you, the nucleus is commonly called the control center of the cell. Um, or the brain of the cell. Essentially what it is, is it's a nuclear envelope. Um, it's essentially a plasma membrane, um, a small nuclear envelope, plasma membrane, that surrounds and protects the DNA and uh, chromosomes on the inside of that little membrane. So um, it's going to be the uh, largest uh, and most obvious um, organelle that you can see underneath a microscope inside of that cell. So all the DNA, all the chromosomes, all the uh, important genetic information is going to be stored inside of the nucleus. Um, the nucleus is going to protect the DNA and keep it shielded um, from enzymes and things that are found inside of the cell that destroy DNA. So without the nuclear membrane to keep the DNA safe, it would be broken down by stuff inside of the cell. So you guys can see here there's little ho uh, holes inside the nuclear membrane. They're called nuclear pores. And what those things do is they serve a purpose to allow ribosomes and RNA and things that are made inside of the nucleolus here. The nucleolus is this little dark concentrated area inside of the nucleus. You can see the nucleus up here and the nucleolus in the middle. And the nucleolus is a little tiny area where ribosomes are going to be put together, where all of the um, RNA that makes up ribosomes is going to be made, um, and where they're going to be assembled. So they're going to be put together inside of the nucleolus, and they will leave the nucleolus, enter the nucleus, and leave the nucleus through the little nuclear pores. They'll leave through the holes and then enter into the cell, um, where they will start transcribing um, RNA and things into protein. So speaking of um, in ribosomes um, and what they're used for, they're going to be found sometimes bound to something called the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum is found as an extension of the nuclear membrane. So you can see that here, the nuclear membrane surrounds the uh, nucleus, and the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be bound to the nuclear membrane. You can see that here, it's just an extension of it. It comes up from the nuclear membrane, it's just a bunch of folding of that nuclear membrane back and forth upon itself, and you can see that up here. You can see it comes up um, right in there, you can see where it's attached, um, and then all the folding back and forth, all of the folding of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, why is it all folded like that? Well, it's folded to occupy less space. Um, if you just had a big straight line up here, you wouldn't have a lot of space. It would just be uh, not a lot of surface area, I should say. Um, but you can fold up and uh, have the same amount of height and fold up things and have a lot more surface area 
um, for things to be uh, done, for um, ribosomes to bind, um, to transcribe proteins and things like that. So it's really folded um, to give significantly more surface area um, to the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum comes in two different types. Oh, by the way, um, that's how it evolved. It evolved through a folding of the nuclear membrane. Well, anyway, um, it comes in two different forms. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum comes directly from the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. Um, is going to be found going all throughout the cytoplasm, and it's got tons of ribosomes bound to it. Hence the name rough. Um, the ribosomes give it a bumpy appearance, um, and that's what gives it the name rough. The ribosomes are going to be bound all the way over it. Well, since it's covered in ribosomes, um, most of the proteins for the cells, you can see here, are going to be made in that area. Um, they're going to be made using the ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and then the rough endoplasmic reticulum can instantaneously take those proteins um, and then package them up and get them ready to be sent out into the cell to go where they're supposed to go. So the ribosomes will make proteins that are meant for cytoskeleton use or meant to uh, make new mitochondria or whatever. Um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum will then take those proteins, um, put them in a little cellular vesicle to ship them around inside of the cell, and then send them on their way where they're supposed to go. The other version is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it does not have um, ribosomes bound to it at all. Um, its purpose is to make, store, um, and send lipids um, pretty much throughout the cell. Um, the cells will use the cell membranes, the lipids on the cell membranes, the process of phagocytosis and exocytosis and things like that. It gets rid of those lipids a lot. Um, and without the ability to make more of them, eventually you would run out of a cell membrane, it would go away, um, and the cell would die. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum makes more lipids um, to replace the stuff that the cell uses from the cell membrane. So you can see here. Um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, all the ribosomes bound to it, um, and then of our smooth endoplasmic reticulum over here, which is meant to send out our protein, our uh, lipids and things. So the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, we can see all the ribosomes bound to it, making proteins, and the proteins are instantly put inside of the ribosome, or excuse me, inside of the um, endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you can see that here. Um, and then the rough endoplasmic reticulum will package them up and send them out, send them out where they need to go. So, um, sometimes proteins and things that the cells make need to be um, re uh, reevaluated or modified a little bit before the job can be finished, before they're completely finished proteins. Um, and that job occurs inside of the um, uh, Golgi apparatus, the um, organelle known as the Golgi apparatus. You can see that here. It's essentially just a big blob of folded membranes and things like that um, called cisternae. You can see that over here. Um, and what they do, the Golgi apparatus is essentially the um, kind of the post office. Um, it takes in things from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it's going to change them a little bit, and it's going to send them all through its uh, uh, cisternae stacks here, change it around what needs to happen, add things to the proteins, whatnot, um, and repackage them up and send them out where they need to go in a fully functional form that's ready to go. So the Golgi apparatus is just kind of the modifier um, and the guy that sends the modified stuff out where it needs to go. So he makes sure that everything's ready to work, um, and then he sends it where it needs to go inside of the cell. As you can see here, the process of transport um, in and out of the cells and things like that. So out of the cell, the nucleolus is going to make all the parts for the ribosomes. The ribosomes are going to be assembled and leave the nucleus out into the um, rough endoplasmic reticulum where they're going to bind. Um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to have proteins made inside of it that are going to leave the rough endoplasmic reticulum through transport vesicles. The transport vesicles will leave the rough endoplasmic reticulum carrying proteins and things like that to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus will then modify those proteins, change them around, and send them out wherever they need to go. Um, if it contains lipids and things like that or waste products, it'll send it to the outside of the cell um, where the cell gets rid of things. Um, if the cell needs to bring something in, it will pinch it and bring it in and then bring it in to where it needs to go um, and process it that way. Some other things that are found inside of the cells are lysosomes, which is a small little um, ball of plasma membrane. It's a little plasma membrane ball that contains uh, digestive enzymes. Um, it's also used to uh, essentially kind of like a water balloon um, that white blood cells and things will use to uh, try to kill uh, bacteria and things. 
vacuole. Um, vacuoles can be found, you can see this over here, they're found inside of cells, and this is how um, uh, cells will store uh, food and nutrients and things like that, waste products and stuff. Um, they come as a food vacuole, a waste vacuole, water vacuole, different things. I mean, this is how the store cell, the cell will store things um, inside of it that it might run out of at some point in time that it's worried it might run out of. Um, and then you can have a phagosome, which is a um, vacuole um, that's been merged with a lysosome. So a vacuole up here, that's a lysosome. Um, they've been bound, um, and then the, the lysosome is being uh, the um, di digesting the stuff inside of that vacuole. So it's breaking down the stuff on the inside. Um, for use for uh, cellular energy. Well, inside the cell, eukaryotic cells have a mitochondria. This is essentially a tiny little bacteria. You can see it has its own little small circular DNA strand. That's a bacterial nucleoid. It has 70S ribosomes, which is a distinctly different thing than eukaryotes have. Eukaryotes have an 80S ribosome. These guys have a 70S ribosome. It's found only in bacteria. They have a cell membrane on the inside, just like uh, bacteria as well. Um, they divide separately from us, and essentially this entire job is to make energy. Their job is to make tons and tons and tons of ATP. Um, once again, they are very interesting. Um, lots of evidence to support that they evolved through the uh, endosymbiotic theory. They divide independently of the cell. You, they, uh, they don't divide when the host cell does. Very interesting um, evidence to support that theory. Chloroplast, the same thing. They have the 70S ribosomes in the inside of them, that little small circular DNA strand that's totally different than the host cell's DNA strain. It's, uh, it's its own unique thing. Um, they have a, two layers of membranes here. These guys were already a bacteria that was eaten, um, which explains the secondary membrane portion. Um, and these are essentially mitochondria, but instead of using um, carbon dioxide, or sorry, um, instead of using uh, sugars and things to make energy, these guys are going to use sunlight um, to make energy. So the sunlight will strike these uh, stromas here, these granums and thalcoids and things, um, and then that will be that energy from the sun um, will be converted into chemical energy um, that the cell can then use to power itself. Ribosomes. Ribosomes are essentially rRNA in a blob of proteins. So rRNA stands for ribosomal RNA and proteins, a big blob of that put together. They're going to be found all throughout the cytoplasm of the cell or stuck to that rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosomes that are found in eukaryotes are significantly bigger than the prokaryotic ribosome. We've talked about that, 80S versus 70S. And once again, they do the same thing, which is making proteins. Eukaryotic cells have a cytoskeleton as well. Prokaryotes do too. Theirs just functions for support. The, prokary uh, the eukaryotic cytoskeleton, on the other hand, functions in support as well. But it also allows um, cells to move things around inside of their cells. Um, this is essentially a, these microtubules here, microfilaments and things that make up the uh, cytoskeleton in, in eukaryotes. Um, runs all throughout the cell, underneath the cell membrane and things like that. Um, so since it runs all throughout the cell, um, it's essentially just a little road um, that proteins and vacuoles and things can be attached to um, and sent around the cell. You can use them to move chromosomes around during mitosis and meiosis, so they're very, very, very useful for transporting things around inside of the cell. Um, they also can influence the uh, way that these uh, eukaryotic oats move, um, so they can move their... Um, their microtubules and microfilaments in a certain direction. If they want to move that way, they can, uh, um, like an amoeba, that's how an amoeba moves. It sends its microtubules up in one direction like this, um, and then it just kind of oozes towards the microtubules. So let's go over some of the uh, um, important eukaryotic microbes that you guys might encounter in a, uh, in a medical setting um, and some of the uh, traits that are found within them. So the first one is going to be kingdom fungi. There are about 100,000 different identified species of fungi, which can be pretty much broken up into two large groups. Ones you can see, macroscopic, and ones you can't see, microscopic. Molds and yeast, microscopic. Macroscopic are going to be mushrooms, things that you're familiar with, toadstools, puffballs, um, and fungi that have gills and things like that, which we'll go over in just a second. The majority of these guys are going to be unicellular. Most of them we cannot see. They're going to be a microscopic. Um, or colonial, um, which means they live together in a group, um, not needing each other, um, just living together with each other. Um, but you have some that have cellular specialization, 
um, forming uh, mushrooms, reproductive structures, and things like that, which we'll talk about. So um, you will find in microscopic fungi, this is only fungi that we can't see, you will find them in two different morphologies, two different shapes, the way they look underneath a microscope in nature. You will find either a yeast form of a microscopic fungi or a hyphae form of a microscopic fungi. So if you put them underneath the microscope, they're either, gonna, um, either going to be yeast, which is round, a little round shape. You can see the round here, a little bud off to the side. These guys reproduce asexually through the process of budding. Um, this guy and he just essentially makes a little tiny clone of himself off the side, which will get bigger and bigger until eventually it pops off um, and creates another identical yeast cell um, to, of the one it popped off of. So that's the process of budding. Um, and then you'll find hyphae, um, which are long, spindly, little filamentous uh, forms of a fungi. Um, you will find uh, cells, some species, that exist in only yeast, only hyphae. And then you will find some that can do both. Um, and these are going to be formed, are called dimorphic. Di meaning two, morph meaning shape. So they can change their shape. They can be found in one or the other. Um, so some pathogenic mold species can do this. Most of uh, most species cannot. Most species of fungi, um, macroscopic fungi, or, sorry, microscopic are going to be one or the other. Most of them can't change and come in both. So how do fungus eat? Fungus are heterotrophic. None of them can make their own food. They are not able to use the sunlight photosynthesis to make food. But how do they eat? So these guys eat through a process called saprophytic lifestyle. Essentially what they do, their little hyphae or the yeast cells will secrete some digestive enzymes from their cells. So uh, digestive enzymes will be secreted out through the cell, um, out into the environment. Um, so this here, you can see this fungus, this is penicillin, is sitting on a, um, an orange. Um, as the penicillin uh, cells, the little hyphae, uh, secrete the digestive enzymes as they grow along the uh, cell, the orange, um, the digestive enzymes will start breaking down um, the orange outside of the cell. Same over here. So this little athlete's foot fungus grows along. Um, the digestive enzymes that it secretes are going to start breaking down the, uh, uh, this, human's, uh, this poor patient's skin. Um, so the orange is going to be start to, to be broken down by the nutrients inside of this fungus. So uh, what's going to happen is after they're broken down, um, the little hyphae are going to reabsorb those broken down semi-digested nutrients. Um, so it's going to suck up uh, orange juice slime um, and human skin slime juice over here. And that's how they eat. They have extracellular digestion. Their digestive enzymes break up stuff out in the environment, and they just suck it back up. Um, so that's called saprophytic. So the vast majority are hapless, uh, harmless saprobes. They live on decaying um, trees, decaying fruits, old um, rotting uh, vegetables and things like that that aren't going to harm anything. Dead animals, dead plants and things like that, no big deal. But some fungus, however, are parasitic um, where they can do that type of lifestyle, saprophytic lifestyle, inside or on another host. Um, and when they eat or uh, the inside of your, of your body or they eat the outside of your body, that causes pain, uh, causes problems, causes disease, and something called a mycosis, an infection with a fungus. Um, fungus can be found all over the world in every single habitat from a really cold, really dry. Um, all different types of fungus are specialized to live in different types of environments. So most of them are not capable of causing problems in humans, but some of them can. And the ones that do are called uh, uh, cause something called a mycosis, a fungal infection. So here's our yeast cell. It's a soft little squishy ball um, that's pretty much all going to look the same. Little tiny round balls, they might be slightly different shape, but they're all, are slightly different size, excuse me, but they're all going to generally be little round balls. And they reproduce asexually through that process of budding. You can see here the nucleus down here is going to split um, as the cell is going to form a little, uh, little ball of uh, goo off to the side, a little cytoplasm ball with some membrane and things like that. The nucleus will split, uh, form another little nucleus in the side here. Um, and eventually what will happen is that process will continue. That one bud will grow another bud, will grow another bud, and eventually the buds will get big enough where they'll pop off um, and start another little single cell off to the side. And so you can see that process up here budding. Filamentous hyphae. 
Um, well, the blob of hyphae, it's essentially like a big blob of roots. They're not roots. They don't function the same as roots, but they look kind of like roots. It's called a mycelium, the big fungus mat, all of the blob of fungus. So all the individual little hyphae, um, you can't see the little hyphae, they're microscopic, but all this big blob of green here would be the mycelium. All the hyphae collectively together, all of them growing together is the mycelium, all the blob of hyphae. It gives things a, a cotton kind of hairy texture. You can see that over here, velvety texture and things like that. That's what you're looking at is the mycelium. So the mycelium, um, you can break that down into different di types of how the hyphae are put together. And that's kind of one of the ways that uh, fungus are uh, classified. Um, if their hyphae are going to have uh, septums, division lines in between them, um, or not. If the hyphae is all flowing together, all the nuclei of all the different cells that make up the hyphae can all float between one another. They're not separated. All of the stuff inside of the cells, all the different cells can flow from one cell to the other. All of them are connected. The other one is a septate hyphae. Different species of fungus have septum in the middle that divide the cells and that physically separate one cell from the other. These cells cannot flow into one another. Primitive um, fungus tends to be a little more advanced evolutionary on the fungal line. You'll have hyphae that are specialized um, only in digestion um, and absorption of nutrients. And those are called vegetative hyphae. I mean, you'll also find hyphae that are specialized in reproduction that make spores. These guys don't make seeds, fungus don't make seeds and things like that, they make spores. Um, and you'll find hyphae that are capable of making spores as well. So um, fungal reproduction is going to be mostly through spores formed on reproductive hyphae. Um, it's asexual reproduction um, where the spores are going to be formed in that hyphae through a process of either budding um, or mitosis and things like that. The different types of fungal classifications have different types of spores. Um, the different types of reproduction gives it their different types of names, different types of classifications, and things like that. So you can see here different types of spores, what they look like, um, shapes of them, and things like that. All asexual different types of mold spores that fungus use to reproduce. So fungal reproduction, um, once again, they, do, they can um, undergo sexual reproduction. It's not as common, but it does occur. And this is going to occur when two spores from two different um, species um, unite or land next to one another, two different individuals, um, and they mate. Now, essentially what's going to happen is you have a, a, a small exchange of genetic information, which will cause a different type of spore to form, something called a zygospore in this particular formation, of, or in this particular species of fungus. Um, the little zygospore is a shakeup of this fungus DNA and this fungus DNA. So that little zygospore has different DNA than its parents. Um, it will open up and release new spores that are genetically different from its parents into the environment. So asexual reproduction, just re releasing spores um, into the environment from your original self, uh, asexual reproduction forming these zygospores um, that are released through the formation of or the uniting of these uh, the, the hyphae. So different species um, of fungus form different types of spores, different types of ways. Um, you can see the business of basidio type fungus, a basidio carp, um, mushroom. We'll talk about the different classifications of fungus here in just a second. Um, and they produce their spores on the undersides of the mushrooms. So you can see a zoomed in version of that. And the spores will be formed on the underside of that mushroom. Those are called caps and gills and things like that. The little spores will then land on the ground, form a new hyphae. The hyphae will mate. You can see what's happening here, causing a new um, mushroom to be grown. And you need different mushroom from that mating process, which has different um, DNA, different types of spores, which can shake up the genetic variability of this population. So the different types of classifications of fungus um, is based on pretty much how the different, what the different types of spores they have and um, how they form them. So if they're formed on conidia, the little cone-looking shapes, um, if their spores can swim, um, if they form basidiospores and things like that, where they're formed, how they form. So zygomycota, this is a very common uh, fungus that's found, um, you guys probably know as black bread mold. These guys are pathogens for uh, uh, insects very often. Ascomycota, a lot of these guys are pathogenic, um, contains penicillin, um, mold, uh, mildew, um, if you are familiar with uh, morels, the type of fungus that people eat, they're all found in this phylum of ascomycota. 
Pisidiomycota is going to be mushrooms, the stereotypical mushrooms you're familiar with in your front yard, the ones you eat, they're going to be found in this phylum. Chytridiomycota are pathogenic fungi um, that cause disease in um, amphibians. Uh, they're all found in the water, which is unique for fungus. Um, almost all fungi are terrestrial, they live on land, whereas this phylum, uh, Chytridiomycota, is exclusively aquatic. They're only found in the water. I mean, then you have different types of fungi that cannot produce sexual spores. I mean, there's, they're known as imperfect fungi. They can only produce asexual spores. So once again, you can identify a uh, fungus. How do you do this? Um, you identify fungus by isolating them on media that's specifically made for fungus. Um, it has media, uh, food inside of it, nutrients that allow fungus to grow, um, that allow only fungus to grow, and things like that. Then you're also going to look at them underneath a microscope or just look at them um, with your own eyes. You're going to look and see how the uh, spores are formed, what shape of uh, structures the spores form under, how the spores look like, what type of spores are they, um, if they have septate hyphae, non-septate hyphae, if they're reproductive hyphae, vegetative hyphae, what color are they, how is it shaped like, is it soft, is it fluffy, is it rough, what does it look like, things like that, and then you can run a genetic scan if you need to, to figure out what the genetics of this particular organism are. Um, and that's how you identify fungus. So what do fungus do? Um, they do a couple of bad things for us. They cause mycosis, fungal infections, and things like that. You can either come in contact with toxins that they produce called mycotoxins. Um, and this happens a lot with uh, um, people that come in contact or have problems with a uh, um, black mold in their house. Um, it's the fungal spores that you're inhaling. Um, that cause uh, diseases in your lungs or the toxins that they produce, mycotoxins, and that tends to be what you're inhaling is the toxins from black, bread, uh, black mold in your house. You can be allergic to that. Um, the toxins themselves, they can grow on you. Um, funguses as jock itch and things like that can grow on you and cause problems as well. Um, storage of, and destruction of food and crops, that's a big deal. Um, if you've ever left bread out too long, it goes moldy, fruit goes mold, lots of different things grow fungus. Um, simply in the field, um, wheat rust, uh, um, corn smut, and things like that. Fungus kills tons of uh, food crops and agricultural crops that we could eat um, all across the globe every year. But they do do lots of good things for us as well. They decompose dead things in the environment. If every single dead plant and every single dead animal that was out there on the planet just stayed around, we would be up to our ankles and dead animals very quickly as well as dead plants. So these fungus recycle all of the nutrients that are trapped inside of those dead ants, uh, animals and dead plants um, back into the environment. They get rid of those bodies. They recycle all the nutrients back into the soil. Most of our antibiotics are going to come from fungi. Alcohol comes from yeast, which is a fungus. Um, lots of organic acids, things like... Um, 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 uh, uh, I can't talk right now, acetic acid, um, going to be vinegar comes from fungus and things like that. Lots of vitamins come from fungus and things like that that we in labs and we grow them. Um, and also we eat them, and that's kind of a big deal. Um, we eat mushrooms. You can also use them to study yeast and things like that. They are eukaryotic cells, which allows them to study, um, or uh, allows scientists to study uh, how uh, different types of chemicals and things interact with eukaryotic cells, which would be similar to our cells. So on to the protist. What are protist? Well, there's two different types of protists. One of them is algae, and the other one is a protozoan. So algae are eukaryotic organisms, which are able to photosynthesize, and they have very primitive photosynthesis. Um, you can see them over here. Um, and then protos uh, protozoans. These guys lack the ability to photosynthesize. They're all unicellular eukaryotes, um, but they share some similar characteristics. So characteristics of algae is they're able to photosynthesize, Protozoans share some other similarities, but they're they're very very odd, diverse group of uh, of organisms. So algae, photosynthetic, um, microscopic forms um, are mostly going to be found in the environment. They also come in colonial forms, filamentous forms, and macroscopic forms that are multicellular and quite large. Things like seaweed and kelp. Um, unicellular. This is an organism called Chlamydomonas, a very stereotypical um, algal cell. Um, it contains chloroplast and chlorophyll. So you can see the chloroplast here um, with the chlorophyll inside making it green. So these guys are able to photosynthesize. Um, they make energy from the sunlight um, and convert that sunlight energy into chemical energy which then can be used to power their cells. They have cell walls which is made out of chlorophyll, the same, or, um, uh, um, um, uh, 
cellulose, excuse me, um, or um, uh, peptidoglycan, depending on if they're a cyanobacteria, a, cyanobacteria, uh, um, a blue-green algae, depends on the species. Um, and they may or may not have flagella. Some species of algae do, some species don't. Um, these are diatoms, very interesting forms of algae down here. And there's a ton of different species of algae. In fact, there's an entire study of algae called phycology. So algae, um, are, most of them are going to be free-living little small organisms found in the water. Um, and they make up the very bottom of the food chain. They make the energy that powers everything above them. Or they're going to be eaten um, as food itself. Um, so they are the bottom of the food chain. Since they're capable of making um, uh, of performing photosynthesis, um, they produce a large amount of oxygen. And now, if you recall from sec uh, lecture one of this uh, course, um, we talked about that the, uh, about forty to sixty percent of the oxygen that we breathe daily um, is produced by algae, not plants. So a very, very, very big deal um, is the production of oxygen by um, algae species. So dinoflagellates are a form of algae. Um, a different type of algae, different group of algae that can sometimes cause something called paralytic shellfish poisoning, or uh, which uh, causes. The, so these guys, they uh, they grow in the the um, salt water in the ocean, and they produce toxins. And most of the time, there's not a lot of these guys in the environment, but occasionally a nutrient bloom can happen, a sewage runoff or something um, that causes tons of nutrients to be introduced to the ocean. And these guys can start growing like crazy. Um, and they cause something called a red tide, where the ocean physically turns red because there's so many of them. Well, they produce toxins, um, and when there's not a lot of them in the environment, those toxins aren't that important. It's not a big deal. Well, when there's a ton of them, um, little filter-feeding organisms like shrimp and things, little oysters, um, will filter feed out the dinoflagellates from the environment. The toxins inside of those dinoflagellates are concentrated inside the little shellfish's body. Um, a human then eats the shellfish. All of those toxins inside of that shellfish are then going to kill the person or cause some severe problems inside of the person when they eat them. Um, so the dinoflagellates in low numbers, the toxins are not a big deal. They don't build up inside of the shellfish very much or the shellfish can get rid of them. Um, but if there's a lot of dinoflagellates, a red tide balloon, the toxins can build up inside of shellfish. And if we eat them, um, it can cause severe problems for us and sometimes even death different classifications of algae down here. You can see how they're organized, if they have a cell wall or not, what it's made up as, um, what color they are, and then what they do in the ro um, role for the environment, if you'd like. So protozoans, these guys are very diverse, 6,500 species, or 65,000 species, I should say. They lack cell walls. It's one of our defining characteristics of protozoans here. Most of these guys are going to be unicellular. Colonies are pretty rare in these guys. They usually live like a, an amoeba by themselves. The vast majority of them are going to be harmless, just doing their thing, living in a little wet environment, the water itself, or some kind of uh, moist little uh, 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 damp environment and things like that. However, some of them can cause problems for humans and animals. Um, the vast majority of those that do are usually going to be spread by insects. Um, things like uh, malaria, um, um, Chagas disease, um, things like that, um, uh, heartworms for d animals, um, those are the little guys that are going to be spread by insects. Every single one of them is heterotrophic. They cannot make f their own food. They have to eat food from other organisms, either you or they eat something else out in the environment. Depends on what their type of digestive and uh, reproductive systems and how they function are. They can either have ectoplasm or endoplasm. Not a big concern for our course. It just means if they have cytoplasm on the inside or outside of their cells, um, how they use the cytoplasm, things like that. Um, and most of these guys are going to eat by either um, engulfing in organic matter directly, just little pieces of sugar and stuff that they find in the environment, or directly eating um, other small microbes out there, either little bacteria or other small protists. So protists um, are going to move around either using a flagella, a cilia, or something called a pseudopod. So pseudopod, pseudo meaning false, pot, uh, pod meaning foot, so false feet. Pseudopods um, work like amoeba. They just kind of ooze around. So if you've ever seen an amoeba ooze around, it sends out a little structure first that's called the pseudopodia, um, and then the amoeba follows behind the little structure that it sends out first. So that's kind of how they work. Um, you're either going to have something called a trophozoite, which is a fully functional 
um, adult protists uh, that's swimming around in the environment, doing its thing, eating, um, it's moving around, it's capable of doing uh, and causing disease. Now, sometimes these guys are capable, not all of them, can form something called a cyst. And if the water dries up, they run out of food, anything like that. They can insist up, which means they form kind of a little bulletproof uh, version of a, of, of a protus. They kind of go to sleep, they go dormant, um, and they go to a, a, a kind of a bulletproof uh, nuclear bunker around them. So this little cyst can sit and stay dormant for hundreds of, of years, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and then when the moisture is added back to the environment or nutrients come back up or whatever, um, that cyst wall will break open and then release the trophozoite back into the environment or back into the host body, whatever it is. Um, and then that process can start over again. So the adult trophozoite's back out eating, um, and then it can send cyst back up if it needs to. So most of these guys are going to reproduce um, uh, asexually. Uh, they all can do it. They mostly only uh, asexually reproduce, but most, or almost all of them can also sexually reproduce as well. They're, they are all capable of asexual reproduction. They mostly only asexual reproduce, but the vast majority of them are capable of sexual reproduction. Don't necessarily need to do it unless the environment's bad, but all of them can do asexual reproduction, which makes sense, and most of them can do sexual reproduction. You classify uh, protists based on the groups, the group of how they're put together, based on how they move around, how they reproduce, and their overall life cycle, how they, um, are, um, how they reproduce, how they uh, uh, live their life cycle, if they have a, a, an insect involved, if they need host, and things like that. So our very first one, we'll go back a little bit, sorry, is mystigiopores. These guys are uh, usually moved by a flagella. Um, some of them do that amoeboid movement, that blobbing around from time to time and they are capable of sexual reproduction. So this is a mystigiopore here. This is Jardialambia. You can see the flagella. Um, you can see how they move around like that as well. Sarcodina, primarily amoeba, mostly amoeboid movement. These guys are going to reproduce asexual, and they're mostly going to be free living in the environment. So this is an amoeba here. Um, these are the little pseudopodes. You can see them poking out here. Um, this little pseudopode, the little false feet, is how this guy moves around. He's going to send his little pseudopodia out, then he's going to blob over, kind of ooze towards the pseudopodia. And that's amoeboid movement using those little pseudopods, those little false feet. So what's going to happen is something is going to be here that this little guy wants to eat, and he's going to send his little pseudopod in to surround him, um, and then eventually he's just going to ooze over the top and then eventually eat the little uh, thing that it's surrounded. Taking a step back, our celiophora. These guys all have cilia. They're capable of cysting up. The vast majority of them are free living and they are almost all completely harmless. So this is our cilia here. You can see the little cilia on them. Um, only once again found in eukaryotic cells um, used for movement. Our last little group there is AP complexa. These guys cannot move at all except for the male gametes. They're male reproductive cycles. Um, they are capable of sexual and asexual reproduction and they are all parasitic. So here's our AP complexa here. Um, these guys are going to be living inside of other cells um, and things like that. They use other cells to get their nutrients. They, um, they have to have another cell to complete their life cycle, which is the big deal here. So here's some pathogenic protozoa. You can see what they're grouped as um, and then the disease that they cause over here um, and then where they're found at in the environment. So a couple of the big important ones, one that you guys might be familiar with is trypanosoma, the flagellated protist. Um, capable of swimming around. Trypanosoma brucei, Trypanosoma cruzi. Um, Trypanosoma brucei is spread by the bite of an African uh, tsetse fly. So the little tsetse fly will take a, a come and bite a human. It takes a blood meal from the human. Um, the little protozoan is living inside of the human's blood. Um, the little fly sucks up some blood with the little protozoans inside of it. The fly flies away, um, bites another human. The protozoans are then introduced into that human um, through that bite process. Um, a couple of weeks later, that person will fall into a coma and die. The other one that's found in South America and parts of the S Central America um, is called Trypanosoma cruzi, um, which causes Chagas disease. So Trypanosoma brucei, African sleeping sickness, and Trypanosoma cruzi is Chagas disease. So Chagas disease uh, spreads the same way, but instead of a tsetse fly, it's spread by the bite of a reduvid bug, often called an assassin beetle. Um, so these guys, they take bites on cats and um, insects out in our, uh, 
armadillos, animals out in the wild, uh, warm-blooded mammals that can carry this trypanosoma brucei uh, or cruzei um, uh, uh, pathogen, this protozoan inside of them in their bloodstream. So what's ha going to happen is they take a bite, a blood meal from a, from the, the environment. They enter into humans where humans live, and they bite your cat um, or they bite you. Um, they tend to come up to our mouths and things like this, um, and they take a little. They drink your saliva, and they'll uh, sometimes bite you up in here, and that's how these um, reduvids enter into your bloodstream, where they bite you, um, and that's how they enter into your bloodstream. So Chagas disease causes um, all kinds of problems, but eventually. Um, it can cause your death by hardening the heart. Um, as these guys enter into the heart muscle, they will destroy the muscle around the heart and cause it to lose its functionality. Um, and eventually you have a heart attack and die. Into amoeba histolytica. Um, amoebic dysentery is dysentery means um, uh, bl uh, bloody diarrhea is essentially what the word dysentery means. Um, it's spread worldwide. Um, it's spread by uh, contaminated water. Um, so cyst of amoeba um, can survive in chemicals like chlorine and things like that, the water treatment plants. Um, they can survive that. So if you get some of these cysts inside of your mouth, um, inside of your nose, they can enter into your, uh, they can go up your nose and things like that and enter into your body. Um, these little cysted up amoeba can enter into your stomach, um, into your intestines, and then they can um, unencyst and the little trophozoites can be released from the cyst. These guys get inside of you. They cause some serious problems with your dysentery and things like that. Um, they're shed through feces through the cyst up process. So there's so many of them, they will eventually start forming cysts inside of your intestines, um, and you start shedding the cyst through your feces. Um, the very, very common spread worldwide, um, amoebic dysentery. So talk about some of the parasitic helmets out there. Multicellular animals, so lots of different cells that are all going to be required for this organism to function as a whole. Totally uh, functional reproductive organs that make things like sperm and eggs. Um, they're capable of digestion, uh, total cellular digestion, movement, um, and they have lots and lots of things for protection, different um, surface spikes and things like that to keep, the, um, to keep themselves safe. Every single one of these guys that we're going to talk about in this class um, parasitizes host tissues. It will attack host tissues and suck nutrients from them or nutrients directly from the host itself. These guys are all going to have creepy little mouth parts that look kind of like uh, barbed wire grappling hooks or uh, fishing hooks and things like that that are used to stick inside of the host cells um, and hold on to your tissues, which is really creepy. Um, they're going to have very well-developed sex organs for the most part that can produce eggs and sperm, so a very complex organism. And these guys are going to have fertilized eggs, which will either be passed directly through your feces, out of your body, into the environment, um, and then something that will eat those uh, eggs, and the eggs will hatch inside of the body, or the eggs will hatch inside of you, and you will pass a little larval um, version of the parasite, so a little small uh, baby uh, larval version of the worm, um, which can be passed through feces and things like that. So one of those two reproductive cycles, you're either going to have an adult that produces eggs that you pass out, the eggs are going to be eaten, start the process over, or the adults that are inside of you are going to produce the eggs which hatch into a little larvae, and then the larvae are what going to be going to be what you shed. It just depends on the different species of helmets. There's two different groups. We have flatworms and roundworms. Flatworms are flat, hence the name no definitive body cavity. Um, their digestive tract is just a blind pouch. They have one hole in, one hole out, one mouth, one anus. It's the same hole. Very simple um, excretory system. They don't really do much. They just digest what you eat for the most part. Um, and they have very simplistic nervous systems, not very complex guys. So tapeworms, um, trematodes, flukes, and things like that we'll talk about in a second. And our next one is roundworms. Roundworms are very uh, a little more complex. They have a, a complete digestive tract with a mouth and an anus, separate holes for separate things, protective surface cuticle, a little covering, a uh, um, little uh, covering that, that keeps them from being uh, broken down in the body. These guys don't have that. Spines and hooks and things which allow them to hold on, um, a little more complex. Um, excretory systems and their nervous system is once again very poorly developed as same up here. So here's going to be our very first one of how we talk about these things and how we classify them. So this down here is going to be our tapeworm, um, our flatworm. So helmets themselves are going to be classified based on how they look, 
how like how big they are, what types of organs they have inside of them, if they have hookers or suckers or things like that, um, if they reproduce with eggs or cysts, or if they reproduce with larval in the inside or outside, if they have larval stages or egg stages and things like that. Um, and you're going to identify a fungal or a, 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 a parasitic infection when it, by, caused by a worm by either looking for the worm itself, um, the larvae of the worm, or the eggs of the worm. So you can find the eggs in the feces, the larvae in the feces, or sometimes the adult worms can be passed in the feces, but you will be able to detect the worm inside of the, um, the patient, and most of the time the larvae and the eggs will be in the feces. Um, so you'll do a fecal float or feces smear and things like that and look for the presence of the eggs and the larvae to determine um, that your patient has adult worms inside of them. There's about 50 or so different species of worms that are known to parasitize humans. Um, they're found all over the world, um, and some of them are restricted to different parts of the world, and that makes sense. If you've evolved to like certain different temperatures, you're going to be restricted um, with, with those certain temperatures where they're found, and that's about the only place you can survive. Um, and a lot of these things have higher instances in the tropics. Um, the tropics tend to breed um, very terrible conditions. There's a lot of competition there, so um, organisms tend to specialize a lot more often. Um, parasites tend to evolve more often in the tropics. There's a lot more things to compete with, so if you can evolve uh, to do something that no one else does to parasitize someone else, you're pretty much making your own, uh, your own environment for yourself that no one else is going to compete with you with. Um, so, once again, you're going to get parasites through your um, into your body, through your patients, through either eating the larvae, um, cause you somebody pooped outside, or they didn't wash their hands well and you got it on their food and things like that, or maybe you were outside and you got some grass on your hands or some feces on your hands and stuck them in your um, mouth and things like that, or you eat some eggs, um, same way, you can get the eggs outside or they can be in your food. Somebody doesn't wash their hands well and things like that. Soil and water, you drink some water that has some uh, some uh, cysts inside of it. Um, you eat some did some dirt in your mouth, maybe some dirt's on your plate that you didn't clean well, or maybe some dirt's on your vegetables and things or that you didn't wash particularly well. Um, and then other diseases that are spread by these guys um, are carried by insects. And billions and billions of people across the planet have some sort of parasitic infection at some point of t time in their life every single year. Very, very, very common. So one of the very common ones that uh, humans get a lot are things called pinworms. So you can see these little pinworms up here. They come in male and female, so very specialized reproductive um, structures in here. The male just produces sperm. The female just produces eggs. And you can see she's filled with eggs here. So what's going to happen is how these little guys work. Pinworms burrow into your feet from the environment. They get in through your feet, through the soil, and things like that. But once they're inside of your environment, they are inside of your body, they're going to be passed around from person to person. Very interesting life cycle. So um, what happens is the females are going to lay their eggs around the um, rim of a child's anus, literally around the edge of the anus. So at night, while the child is asleep, the little female will poke her, um, her anus out of the... Um, literally out of the uh, uh, little baby's sleeping baby's anus and lay her eggs all around the edge of that child's anus. Now the eggs are covered in a little sticky substance that's very itchy. So this little baby, um, this little girl, will, um, when she wakes up, she'll reach back there and start reaching, uh, scratching to get rid of those eggs, to get rid of the itching part. She gets all the little sticky eggs all over her fingers. She sticks them in her mouth or in your mouth, in her friend's mouth and whatever. And that's how these cycles can uh, continue. Um, you diagnose pinworms by putting a little piece of tape over um, the sleeping baby's anus and in the morning you will be able to see um, worms stuck on that tape. A very easy treatment, pin away, you can buy it at the grocery store. A um, very common infection in small children. So let's go ahead and finish this up with our common bacterial infections um, and then we'll go ahead and be done with this lecture. So gonorrhea, a very interesting STD. It's very, very highly resistant to a lot of drugs. Oddly enough, it is gram-negative, but penicillin um, worked on this particular uh, bacteria for a very long time. One of the very few gram-negatives that penicillin can work on is a diplococcus, meaning two circles put together. Symptoms, once again, uh, very stereotypical for STDs to have no symptoms. Um, you don't want your patient, or your, your host, I should say, to know that they're infected. You want your patient to continue on about their normal day-to-day -day businesses, passing you around um, like nothing has changed.
But symptoms can be painful urination um, or painful sex, burning after sex and things like that, burning after urination, um, discharge from the penis or the vagina down here, pelvic inflammatory disease or endocarditis, swelling on the insides of the reproductive areas and things like that. Two to 12 days after you come in contact with that bacteria, you will start to develop symptoms if you do. I mean, less than 50% of people that have this disease or that come in contact with this bacteria will develop symptoms. A route of infection is sexual. You can get it, however, from childbirth. Um, so it can be passed around through childbirth. You can also get it in your mouth and things like that, in your eyes. You can imagine how this one got there. I'm not going to go ahead and fill that in. You guys can use your imagination. Diagnosis, they can either test the urine itself for presence of the bacteria in the urine, or they can do a swab of the urethra or the cervix to test for the bacteria that are found on there. Azithromycin or IV cetrofoxin, depends on how bad the infection is. Azithromycin in pill form tends to work pretty well. Not the most common disease on the planet, but it is on the rise um, as it is becoming more resistant to antibiotics. Um, in Europe, it is a completely resistant bacteria to all um, known treatments. Um, if you have gonorrhea, you will not die from it. It won't kill you, but you will die with it, meaning that they have no treatment for it. Um, unless your body naturally sheds it, you will die with this bacteria in your body. Tuberculosis, very interesting little bacteria, um, commonly known as um, in old days as the consumption and things like that. Um, so if you've ever heard that in those old movies, that's what they're talking about. They died of consumption. They died of tuberculosis. Obligate pathogenic, technically gram uh, positive, doesn't stain gram positive because it has mycolic acid in it, so it is considered an acid fast bacterium. Spread around through respiratory droplets, so you cough on somebody um, and they get the little droplets inside of them that contain the bacteria. This bacteria grows extremely slowly. Um, it can grow uh, on um, inside of your lungs. It can take months to years for it to ever um, show symptoms. You can have latent or active TB. Latent is means it's resting, it's chilling, this person seems healthy, um, they don't seem any problems at all, um, but then when their immune system takes a dip, that tuberculosis can switch over into active tuberculosis, where you start to exhibit the cough, um, fever, blood, coughing up blood, and weight loss, and things like that. Essentially what's happening is, that happening is this bacteria is eating your lungs, it's causing you to cough so much that you can't keep food down when you cough, um, it causes your lung tissue to be damaged, to cause little tiny tears that lets the blood out, um, constant coughing, the tears never have time to heal, causes scar tissue to form, um, and then eventually what happens is you can't get enough air in to keep yourself alive and you die. Um, they do something called a purified protein derivative test for this, if you've ever had a PPD test interesting little test for tuberculosis. They put a purified protein derivative. It's essentially um, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis um, bacteria in a blender. They blend it all up and stick the juice underneath your skin in a little tiny injection spot. They draw a circle around the dot. If you've ever had tuberculosis, your body will have a massive reaction to that. Your antibodies will go off like crazy, turn the entire circle bright red. If you've never had tuberculosis, you have no antibodies for it, so therefore no reaction will occur. They can also do a lung x-ray to check for the presence of damage in your lungs that this bacteria may or may not have caused. Antibiotic treatments, unfortunately, it is becoming resistant to antibiotics, MDTR, multidrug resistant tuberculosis, not a very fun thing. 33% um, of people across the world carry tuberculosis inside of them. Um, some pe most people carry tuberculosis bacteria. Um, it just doesn't cause problems. Um, it's cyst up inside of your lungs. One or two bacteria is not able to cause problems, and your lungs can handle it. Um, your immune system can kill them. Very, very, very common inhaled bacteria. Um, but it does show up from time to time. It's actually a little more common than most people think, and about 1.3 million people on the globe die of tuberculosis yearly. And our last one is Yersinia plestis, pestis, the Black Plague, gram-negative rod-shaped cocoa bacillus. You can see it up here. It's kind of like a little ball, um, kind of like a little rod. You can kind of see that up there. Fever, headache, vomiting, swollen lymph nodes, very common onset of symptoms for this thing. And it's spread by the bite of an infected flea. Um, so the flea has the bacteria inside of his um, guts. He bites you, um, and then you can you get the uh, um, bacteria into you that way. You can also inhale it through... Um, respiratory routes as well as well you can get it inside of your uh, your lungs and things well, anyway there's three different types of uh, plague you have the bubonic plague 
which is the one you guys are familiar with, which attacks the lymph system, causes um, blood and things to coagulate and become destroyed, which causes these black boobules to uh, form all over the body, black boobules, which is where the name bubonic plague comes from. They're filled with uh, de uh, coagulated and destroyed blood and plague bacteria and things like that all over the body. Septicemic plague is when the organism gets inside of your bloodstream and goes to your extremities and things like that. This is what happened to this guy. Um, the bacteria ate his um, extremities and he lost his fingers. You can have pneumonic plague, um, which is where that bacteria gets inside of your lungs and does the same thing over here. Um, it destroys the insides of your lungs. And essentially, this is the same type of death sentence as tuberculosis. This is called the white plague and then the black plagues over here. Um, you look for the bacteria in the bloodstream. Um, you can detect it in other bodily fluids as well, urine and things like that. Treatment is pretty simple, pretty easy treatment. If they'd have had these antibiotics back in the day, this would have uh, been a very successful um, way to treat the plague. Pretty uncommon nowadays, but it does exist. It's mostly found across the world um, in places that are um, uh, devoid of human contact. Um, with lots and lots and lots of rodents. So in the United States, it's found west of the Mississippi River, um, or sorry, uh, around the Rocky Mountains and things like that, where there's lots of uh, rodents and things to carry it. Um, so the bacteria persist in the poor little rodents and things like that, um, where there's lots of uh, fleas and things. The fleas bite the rodents, reinfect the rodents. The rodents are then fed on by fleas, which reinfect the fleas, which reinfect the rodents, and so on and so forth. And that's how that cycle continues. You come out into the woods, um, traipsing around going camping, these fleas from the rats get on you and bite you, and that's how you become infected. So about 10% of people that come in contact with this will die, um, even with treatment. So about 65% uh, deaths per year of Black Plague. Very interesting little bacteria. Hey guys, so this is the end of this lecture series. Um, if you have any questions about this one, please feel free to email me. If not, have a great rest of the day.